Mr. Jongman, Jongman, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you, Mr. Motoko? I'm fantastic. It's so nice to, to have you, man. <laughs> yes. So it's not so nice to have you. And um, I believe that um, you, you, you and I know that it was not easy for us to, 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 to get to this level yes. where we have this interview because of your schedule. Yes. Yes. Um, now, obviously, we are in the COVID-19 era. People are worried. Some people are dying. People are ill. People are losing their jobs. Businesses are closing. Um, I, I brought you here because I believe you have something useful to share with the audience, to brainstorm together and see how we can influence the thinking of people, not only in Botswana, by the way, okay. but in Southern Africa, in Africa, the rest of the world. Some of the people in the community who are watching our videos are actually from Europe, others are from America, others are from different parts of the world. So um, obviously I know much of the, the examples can be more about Japan and Southern Africa, but feel free to speak, I mean, wherever it can be applicable elsewhere. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So obviously people want to know, before we go any further, who is Jongman? Young man. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Mutoko. Um, Jong man is, a, is an HR practitioner um, with about 17 years' experience. I've worked in around uh, five different sectors. I started off my career with, with, with Cresta Group of Hotels um, for about three years, and then I then joined another hotel to be closer to, to my mom at the time because I just lost my dad. I lost my dad at, at a very young age. So I then relocated from my home because I was working in my home at the time to come to Aburoni where I was wanting to be closer to my family. And then I joined Piemont Group. Um, that's where I think I was given an opportunity to, to be in, in a leadership role where one of the, the managers there, or my, my then manager then left for a job in South Africa. So I was given that opportunity to, to lead. I was there for around about five years with Piemont Global. Um, I then got an opportunity to join Safalana, um, one of the biggest fast moving consumer goods in, in Botswana. And uh, I joined them as an HR officer. And uh, ultimately, after the confirmation, after about three months, they needed an industrial relations manager. I then um, took up on that opportunity to, to be the IR manager for, for, for all the, the stores. I was with them for only <laughs> for a year. And um, after that year, I then got an opportunity to to, to join another company, one of the biggest companies in, in, in Botswana, being um, Debswana. I was made an offer by Debswana. And um, no, I've, I've, I think, let me, let me rephrase, let me, let me re rephrase. I think at the time I then joined Stefanucci Stocks. Stefanucci Stocks. At the time, it was called Stocks and Stocks. It's a construction company, one of the biggest in, in Botswana and I mean Southern Africa because they've got presence in, in Zambia, they've got presence in Zimbabwe, yeah, and South Africa and Botswana and Namibia. And I was the um, HR manager for, for both Botswana and Northwest, where we had projects in the University of, 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 of Northwest. We had presence in the hospital that was in Freiburg. We had an, another project in, in Rustenburg. So I, I then joined them. I was mostly moving between Botswana and South Africa, working for, the, for, 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 for that construction company for about five years. And then from, from that opportunity, um, I then got to have an opportunity to work for Tiffany and Company. 
uh, which is um, one of the leading uh, diamond or jewelry manufacturing companies. It's a subsidiary of, of Tiffany, but they mostly cut and polish, polish diamonds. At the time, they had um, pro, um, in, uh, factories in Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. And um, I joined them at a time when the diamond industry was not doing so well. And um, they then had a request where the three countries, Namibia, uh, South Africa, and Botswana, were to hit a certain milestone in terms of productivity. Um, and we had to now come in and help the, the company achieve certain targets, which um, it was not an easy, an easy job because at the time the, the, the employees were not very happy, thinking that the company is not investing much into them. And all they wanted was just production, production, production. So we got in there, we tried to stabilize the company by engaging more with the people and showing them the, the need for us to sustain or to keep our jobs by producing more. And um, I, must, I must be happy to say that the, the employees were very um, cooperative and we ended up being able to, to keep the jobs. And unfortunately for our subsidiary in, in Namibia and South Africa, they were not able to because Tiffany ended up closing those two businesses. And even now, business is still operating. Um, after which, I then got an opportunity when, where I felt that I had done whatever I could or learn from the diamond industry. I, I always had an um, um, envy to join the financial services sector. And I had that opportunity in August of 2017, where I now joined First National Bank, where I'm still the human capital business partner. And the post I've been holding for about two and a half years. On the side, Jongman is also a small businessman. I've got a small um, consulting business on the side. I also happen to be a student because learning doesn't stop. I'm currently um, studying my executive MBA with Sheffield Harlem. And um, I also happen to sit at the industrial court as a member of the court where I've been uh, nominated by Business Botswana to represent the, employee, the, 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 employee, the, the employer sector, the business sector. So that's, that's who I am. And I, I would say I'm very passionate about, you know, helping others. I work closely with um, the unemployment um, guys, especially the, there is a, a non-governmental organization by Christopher who, who works with people or graduates who are unemployed to help them prepare for interviews, prepare for, for the future jobs, tips in terms of what they should do. I help them with the reviewing their CVs and preparing for, for the different interviews. So that's, that's in a nutshell who I am. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for telling us who Jongman Jongman is and uh, your passion and your experience. 17 years. <laughs> That's amazing. man. Now, um, obviously we are in this COVID-19 crisis mm -hmm. and it's not just the COVID-19 crisis. It's also um, the other challenges that come along with it. And uh, each time I sit down to think, I'm thinking about how is everybody coping out there? You think of the entrepreneurs, you think of the business leaders, you think of, you know, employees. Some people have lost their jobs. Some were looking for jobs. Some are graduates that were still looking for jobs and things get to this. And I think there's a lot of turmoil in people's minds. So... What kind of mindset do you think somebody should have right now, whether they are a business leader or they are an entrepreneur or a potential entrepreneur or they are an employee? What, what kind of attitude or mindset should they have to keep themselves going without having to hang themselves or, you know, to get things worse for them? 
it's, it's, it's a very challenging times for, for all. Um, I think for me, my, my views are that resilience, it's what will keep us um, sane. And, you know, for those that are still employed, like myself and the others, they should be grateful for the opportunity. And they should right. now right. see, you know, in Africa, we are, we are interrelated in a very, I don't know, in a very high level than probably in other, other parts of the country. Because you find that I've got a cousin who's, who's unemployed. And now, as opposed to maybe what I know the government is saying, let's help. As opposed to now going and helping from the government, let's start from home. Let's start helping each other from where we are. If I have, let me not say, okay, the government has got a pro program where there are now the grants are being given, where they're given food rations and all of that. Let me help where I can. In terms of the businesses, the business should also support the employees that they hire, especially the frontline employees. Oh. We should be grateful. And I must take this opportunity to say, we are very grateful and we should also um, take care of those people that are out there, the essential services that are your nurses, the police officers, the people that are keeping the economy and the banking employees and everybody else who's now working at this time because they're risking their lives for us to, to be able to, to sustain. And I must say um, that the people, like I said, they should be resilient they should have a positive mindset. We should keep ourselves fit. I believe in, in, in a very healthy body for a strong mind when, when your body is weak. So I urge people to, to keep exercising, to, to keep on working, um, working out and eating healthy. I know it's difficult and eating healthy can be very, can be very, very, um, how can I put it? It's, it's, it's very costly. So that's what we should also try to do. As, as employers and businesses, my, 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 my call to them is they should be very empathetic. Um, decisiveness in terms of what is it that we need to do? How are we going to do it? And not wait for a perfect moment. Let's do and, 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 and perfect as we go. That's, that's, that's what I think should be the right mindset to not waiting for the right time, but starting and continuing as we go. Thank you very yeah. much, um, Mr. Jongman. Jongman, and going back to when you were telling us about yourself, you mentioned that you are actually going to school. You are actually a student and it shows that you value learning. And I think uh, at a time like this, it's not a time for people to just sleep, but for everybody, you know, it's time to develop themselves, uh, mm -hmm. keep moving, do something, you know, Exercise more than ever you, you have ever done. Whatever it is that you can do that causes you to have a bit of fulfillment. Yeah. And then obviously there are, in my mind, because I'm not a human capital specialist. Yes. I'm thinking, isn't it we have policies that we have um, at, uh, at national level? We have policies that we have at uh, organizational level. Um, with the things that are happening, with the changes that are happening, in my little mind, you know, not being a human capital expert, I'm thinking there must be some policy implications to the way we are now doing things. What are some of the things that come to your mind that uh, employers need to think about in terms of their policies? Maybe there are things that were not covered in the policies that need to be covered now. And also, um, since you sit in the industrial court, I'm sure you can have some insights that you can give probably to not only employers, but business leaders and probably uh, policy makers nationally. I think uh, my views are that one of the first things that should be reviewed is that every business or most companies have what they call a business continuity plan. Those, right. those policies were tested. And the loopholes have been identified. As we speak, um, uh, for me, I think those are the, that, that is where the starting point is. Should, people should be looking at those plans and reviewing and not waiting until COVID-19 is over. But now people busy to review them and test them and uh, implement and say, this is what, how it used to look like. This is now how it's going to look like going forward. 
Um, in terms of policies that I think should also be reviewed, um, certain policies like, um, you know, working from home. In some, in, some, in some businesses, I think it's one of the areas that the employers were not very open about it or they were very, very skeptical about implementing. Now is the time for us to come up with working from home policies and flexi hours. Um, and, you know, if you talk about working from home and flexi hours, you open up a can of worms in terms of now the cybersecurity threats that comes with me now having access to my employer's network from here. And, you know, people now fishing out there and wanting to hack into businesses' networks and stealing information. And we should now be looking and reviewing how can we better our security or cybersecurity uh, policies and making sure that we also, not only the policies, but the, the networks themselves to make sure that the company information is, is protected. We should also be looking at, my view is that a lot of companies were not looking at recruiting using platforms like your Zoom, your Skype and all of that. So I, I'm sure we should now be looking at how we integrate or we I review our policies to integrate and allow that to happen. You know, most of the companies will tell you that if you work for me, you're not allowed to work for anybody else or to own another uh, company. This is the time that now those policies that are excluding all these things should be reviewed so that people are allowed, because the reality is that we've been talking about this fourth industrial revolution. It's here, it's now. This The future that we've been talking about, it's here and now. And now, we're not going to go back and everything is going to be normal. We should be now uh, embracing it and start doing that. And a lot of people are now going to want to, to be in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position to now have side gigs where I can maybe work for two or three other companies so that I diversify my, my income streams. You know, um, In terms of nationally, I think we, we need to, to look at the way things have been done previously to firstly, you know, policies in terms of network accessibility, it's a big thing. The fourth industrial revolution or, or today's times dictates that, you know, access to internet, you know, access to, to, to a lot of or cheaper uh, bandwidth or cost of internet that is cheaper. Even the way we've been schooling, um, it should change because now the social distancing in my view, is still going to continue for some time before we go back to the normal, if ever there is going to be a normal. Interesting. Thank you so much. Actually, <laughs> I, I like the way you are putting these things across. And uh, thinking of uh, social distancing, it doesn't look like it should be called social distancing. I think this is more of physical distancing. <laughs> yes. we need to go back to the words <laughs> and call yes. it physical distancing because yes. social media people mm -hmm. are very very much well engaged there so in terms of social people are socializing but the physical yes. aspect is the one that is affected and oh. uh, now t talking about some of these policies i think some business leaders or people in leadership positions are having it very rough right now especially those who like micromanaging. Yes. What advice do you have for such people? At least, Because, I mean, we can't condemn them. This is what yes. they know. This is what they have been doing. But is there something we can sort of advise them to say, guys, as leaders, things have changed. I mean, you cannot, because how do you micromanage people who are at home? I heard of a company that has developed an app or somewhere in, the, in, in a certain country. They developed an app. And then they said everybody is supposed to use this app. And that app, what it does is to monitor what you do at home. Are you really working? And you see somebody who is very fond of micromanaging and it shows lack of trust. I think that, that's, that's one of the biggest things that um, um, a lot of employees are dealing with. Stress in terms of impressing by being online, if, even if when you, you don't need to. Um, you know, by having long meetings the kind of leaders who would have long meetings so that they have control. And now what happens is that most of the employees have to do what they, the actual work now very late and that impacts on the, on the families and the, even the, 
even their, their own health because then the, the, the breaks are not there. So for me, the leaders should be supported mostly by HR ourselves to ensure that we now help them to deal with the normal, to say the way you've been working is not the way that can work now. The KPIs that we've set for the employees, they have to be changed, they have to be reviewed. Even the way that we manage, we have to now trust people more, give them job and, you know, support them and show them that we are here for them. We trust them. We have, uh, we have hired them to do our job. So let's give them the liberty to do what they know best. And all we can do is to support them because for them to be able to give us the best result, their mindset should be in a very, very good state. They should feel supported. They should feel trusted because without that trust, they're not going to perform. And the reality is that those people who should also support them because they're having it hard, they're having it rough because they don't know how. And like I said, the human capital practitioners should support them more to ensure that they help them so that the employees can also um, be able to thrive. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Now, we have looked at the business leaders. Let's talk to the employees because we also have some impossible employees who um, probably during face-to-face -face working, they were dodgy or they were, you know, let's just face the facts, Mr. Yes. Jongman. Uh, we have some people that are difficult to deal with. The, the leader says, let's do this. They do their own thing. Now, what advice do you have for such people? Because I, I fear that it's very easy to lose your job now than ever before. Because in the mind of every business leader right now is, how can I cut costs? How can I increase revenue? And it's not going to be easy to increase rev revenue quickly, but it's easier to, to maintain profits by cutting costs. And one good way of cutting costs is to let some people go home. You know, and remember, we are talking about different countries here. There are mm -hmm. countries that have said that maybe the government has said, look, you, no employer should terminate employment unless, unless you are closing down. And then in other countries, it's not like that. So we want to try and help our brothers and sisters out there. Maybe they were difficult. They were not doing their work properly. They were not available. I think this is the time. For, for, for them now to be more engaged? How can they be more engaged and show that they are interested to be part of the team? It's, it's, it's a very tricky one because for me, employee engagement cuts, cuts both ways in that, you know, I, I always say to people that the, the underperformance or people who are always dodgy, they know that, that what they're doing is wrong. They know. And um, my view is that they just need to now reflect, introspect, and say, for me to be continuing to be a part of this organization, I have to change the way I've been working. I have to now come to the party because the reality is that even those, um, those laws that say they cannot be let go for now are not going to be there indefinitely. And most of the companies know who is the most valuable, who's coming to the party, and who's slacking. So my advice to them is that, that the party is over. They should now come in and start contributing for their own sake, because if they don't, the companies are not, are not going to be there. The second part is that for me, it's not only about where they are, it's about now. They need, employees need to now review their skills and look at what is it that they can do. Um, you know, retool themselves, look at what is it that they can also do apart from what they've been doing, what is it that they can do to enhance um, what they've been, the skills that they have, looking into the future skills that they've been talking about, you know, your self-awareness, you know, the integrity part, you know, you know, being innovative and all of those uh, fancy skills that are needed. Because now, if you're not very, um, if you're not a very good employee, the, your, your, your next employer is going to, to check reference from the from the previous one and obviously you're not going to have um, a very good reference i know in, in other countries that is not allowed so they'll then move to another company and for me i don't think that will last for them because 
let's face it, the number of job opportunities out there has reduced drastically and only the best are going to get an opportunity. Not only the under, not, not, not even the average performers. Forget the, under, the, the, the poor performance. The, that's just the average performance. So you have to be very exceptional for you to even get an opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Jongman. I think this is a very, very serious matter. Um, I know it's not easy for people to change habits overnight, but yes. if at all somebody has been slacking and they have not been working hard, this is the time to start changing their habits. Yes. And depending, I mean, there are so many people who are looking for jobs right now. And imagine you have a job and you're actually playing with it. Yes. You are actually asking your employer, you are making it very difficult, even if your employer didn't want you to go. You are pushing them in the corner to, to, to let you out. And um, we are in a very, you know, sensitive time in the sense that um, everybody is beginning to learn how to work virtually. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you learn how to use Zoom, you learn how to do YouTube, uh, you know, you learn how to interview people via Skype, you learn how to... And then you suddenly realize that you don't necessarily have to hire people that are around you. Yes. Because I'm seated here in Botswana right now. I can mm -hmm. actually have um, a virtual assistant sitting in another continent. That's true. And imagine if I have an assistant in Botswana right now, who, whom, whom I was working with physically, and mm -hmm. I now test and, and I see that, ah, having a virtual assistant is so powerful. Why have I been wasting time with this person who is not even engaging? It's not about somebody being visible at the end of the day, but it's about yes. the output. Right yes. now, people are beginning to see that you can go on websites such as Fiverr and you mm -hmm. get your designs done there. Yes. Very cheaply. Very and you can cheap. imagine maybe you are running a small business where you are a designer and you don't care about your, your, your customers and things like that. It means you are going to be out of business. So I think it's, it's a very, very important time for people to reflect. If you are still have a job, for argument's sake, let's say you, you know that your job begins from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock or whatever time it is, I advise that it's important for you exactly 8 o'clock, be ready. Yeah. If you have a room where you are working from or you are working from your bed, whatever it is, exactly 8 o'clock, make sure you are ready T tell your family, guys, 8 o'clock, I'm at work, mm -hmm. all right? If it means you are researching or you are attending meetings and your phone is near you so that mm -hmm. if there is a call, you are there to answer. You have to be available. You are no yes. longer there physically, so, yes. so you have to be there virtually. If your phone rings three times, four times, five times, one hour later, that's when you realize there's a missed call and your teammate was calling, or your customer was calling, your supplier was calling, or your leader was calling, and you do that every day, and email is sent, you see it two hours later, it means you are not mm. working. Yes. What are you suggesting? You are not working, you are not available on your phone, you are not available on WhatsApp, you are not available on Skype, there is a meeting you don't join, every day you have an excuse, you are putting yourself in danger. Not only yourself, but you are actually dragging the rest of the team backwards and you are dragging the nation backwards. That, that's very true. I think it's, it's, you, you've put it so well, Mr. Mutoko, uh, Dr. Mutoko, that um, a lot of people now, they should know that the promptness in terms of, like you're saying, response time, you know, availability. Because also the synergies or the, the work uh, hubs that we have created to bounce off ideas are no longer there. So you need to be available for those people that need your support or need you to contribute to a project so that now you can meet that deadline. You can be able to respond to that customer query. You can be able to now deliver on your end as a business. Forget the individual, but the business, because now the customers out there are looking at a business and not somebody. So the business will be very quick to, to cut off somebody who's not uh, contributing because their brand or their reputation is at risk. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I think everybody should just remember that it's time to be on our tours like never before. Yes. It's time to try and give exceptional customer service like never before. It's time for you to, to work. I mean, be, be part of the team, the A team, yes. everybody mm -hmm. who is concerned. It's not time for blame game. 
if somebody makes a mistake, understand that all of us are experimenting. We are trying to see what works and what doesn't work. So you cannot be shouting at your team. You cannot be shouting at your leader. You cannot be shouting at your colleagues. It's time to learn. Rather, be a solution provider. I normally say to people, don't be a problem creator. Rather, be a problem solver. In the world, I think we have more problem creators than problem solvers. That's why we have a lot of problems. So one can choose to say, I want to be a solution provider. If there is a mess, quickly think, what can we do to come out of this? Not what can my manager do? What can my CEO do? What can my uh, human capital manager do? Or what can my employee do? All of us need to come to the party and try to make sure that you know, we, are, we are solving problems. And I wanted to just say, wh what are some of the challenges that you, I know, I know it was not part of the questions here, but I'm, I'm just curious to, you know, I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes of a human capital manager or director or, uh, or CEO or, um, or, or partner at this juncture. I know, you know, human capital has an, a very big function in any organization. Mm -hmm. Now you can imagine in this chaos, what are some of the challenges that you are dealing with? And not necessarily in your organization, but generally. Because remember, Mr. Jongman, you have such a rich history. You have worked across different industries. Mm -hmm. So without you even mentioning that when I was in this company, this happened when I was... No. 2008, 2009, 2010, we had a tough time across the world. I'm sure yeah. there must be some things also that you and your team did to make sure that you come out of this. So feel free to just allow yourself to give advice, even though you may not give specifics to say, when I was in this company, when I was in this company, what are some of the things that people can, what are some of the things that right now human capital is facing and how can they deal with those? I think the, the, the biggest one is, um, it's, 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 you know, um, being able to, to reach out to the people or touching people in that um, you, you, you have to be in a position to advise both the employees and, and, and the employers. So a lot of the times there's, there's um, a lot of mistrust with, with, with the human capital practitioners out there in that um, the employees would look at you and see somebody who's more of a policeman and um, the, the company will look at you and say that you are protecting the employees. So some of the challenges that we face are getting through to people, like you're saying, how do you now get to somebody who does not want to work? You know, at times you find that this person is, is their motive is not to work, but it's just to fool around. And at times when you let them go, you are seen to be very cruel because he's not contributing. So you now um, find ways of letting this, pe this person go within the, the defined labor laws or the rules that are, that, that are there. The, the other challenge is, 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 is that um, as, an, as, 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 a, as, a, as an HR practitioner, a lot is expected, but we never you know, pause take stock of ourselves as well and, uh, you know, review our careers or look at how we've been doing things and modernize the ways of doing. And the majority of the time we get stuck in not growing because we are all, all about helping other people grow and forget ourselves, even from a psychosocial point of view, where let's say in this pandemic, you are, you are asked to do permits for employees, you are asked to ensure that they are safe and keep the fire burning. And in that quest to now help everybody, you now burn out because you are forever being asked for help here, there, and in other areas. So in my view, the other challenge is that um, some managers are very difficult, like you're saying, the trust issues where they will be hell bent on making decisions that are not the right decisions and you know risking uh, that employees or, or, or letting people go without following process because they don't want to wait all they need is to get rid of that employee even if it was now going to take 
four months for us to follow the rules to let somebody go. They want it done like today. They'll come and say, I don't want this employee ever again because they've cost me a business. Yes, they have cost the business, but the rules and regulation that needs to be to be followed to arrive at that. So it's, it's, it's not easy, but um, I think one of the, 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 the few, how can I put it, experiences or what I've found out is that, you know, connecting with the people and engaging them more and finding out who they are, where they come from, where they are going, will help you because especially with the, the, the new employees, most of the time, all they want is a job, but they don't have a plan of, okay, where will I be in the next five years, in the next 10 years, am I okay? What is the plan? Where am I going? All they want is that job and they don't have any other plan. So we should be there for them. We should engage them more and find out their stories, where they're going and help them to, to transition because most of the time as well, most employees, they lose out or they get demoralized because they cannot move up the ladder. We should be open about, you know, helping people, even if they, it means working for another company because it's about them being able to contribute as opposed to now being stuck or holding somebody at ransom to keep them in a job that they are not very motivated. They're just only coming because they're looking for a paycheck. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. You, you have said something that led to a question that I was about to ask you. So you are mentioning the importance of um, business leaders and any leader anyway, to make sure they engage with their team. Yeah. And I always say to leaders, if you're going to be a good leader, you need to know your team very well. Yeah. And I always give an example of many, many years ago when I was a school teacher, I had this particular principal right? This principal was extremely smart. And she showed that she cared for her team. One of the ways she did that is she understood everyone who was under him. So you will find, for example, uh, it can be a Monday morning. Um, we have started work. Maybe she comes to the staff room. She will go desk by desk talking to each one. So, and she knew what to say. She would come to my desk and say, for example, Mr. Mutoko, how are you? I'm good. How is your wife? How are the children? How was church yesterday? Because she knows I'm a family man and I'm a God lover. And those are the things that excite me. So for, mm -hmm. she didn't do it every time, but each time she did it, you know, there was a dose of motivation that came in. Then interesting enough, she could possibly go to the next, next desk. That person also is a family person. That person also goes to church and they love God, but maybe those, they don't talk much about that. Probably they like football. Mm -hmm. And then the principal will go to that desk and say, hey, Jane, hey, Liverpool, yesterday. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they start talking about Liverpool. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. Three minutes, they are done. She goes to another person. But... That kind of thing comes through a commitment from the leader to say, I want to know my team. I want to know what makes my employees tick. I want to know their fears. I want to know their worries. And I think at this juncture, it's even more. So the CEO must understand the people who are immediately under him, him or her. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that it's a big organization there is a CEO and there are some directors underneath. So mm -hmm. the CEO must make sure that he or she understands each of the directors. What makes them tick? What do they love? What do they love? What do they do ap apart from when they are at work? Do they have families? And so on. And then each director must understand all the managers under them. Something like that. And each manager must. So it must go down to everybody. So it's a culture within the organization. I saw you, you wanted to say something about that. <laughs> yeah, I think when, when you say that, it reminds me of my, <clears throat> one of the leaders that I still feel that maybe I should have worked with him earlier in my career. Maybe I should, I, I would be far. His name was um, Bini Philip. Bini Philip joined, um, joined our team or he was part of the team that I worked for at Laurelton Diamonds Botswana. He came 
as a as a as a as a as a profession. He was coming from a textiles industry, and he did not know anything about the diamonds. And his philosophy was, you know, knowing the people, right. knowing what the man likes, what makes him tick. And he also had a concept what he called jamba walks. He said to me, John, man, um, when you have employees, you should also look at what they do and observe and learn and engage the people and find out what makes an exceptional coalition or an employee that way of working, the way they do things, and somebody who's struggling. When he has opportunities, he'll just come in and have those little conversations and find out what the guys who are doing well, we're doing. And when he's talking to the guys that are struggling, he would also give them tips and say, you know what, I was talking to this other coalition. This is what he tells me. This is his approach. And why don't you sit down with them and, and engage them? And he had a way of, you know, asking you questions in a way that even if you've maybe prepared a report and you've missed something or you've overlooked, he'll ask you, you'll start off like you're saying, talking about what I love, football and marathons and keeping fit and, you know, grooming the youngsters and talking to me about, okay, what about that Polisha? What is it that they're struggling about? And who have you identified in the group that can possibly come and join us in the event that we need another Polisha? We'll be talking about that because they know it excites me. And then out of the blues, you'll say, you know what, Jongwen, um, that report that you sent to me, what, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about Without him being critical, but when you reflect, you go back and his parting words will be, no, I didn't say you, sh it's, it, you should go and review it, but I was just thinking maybe you should um, have thought about that. And it will be in you to go and look at it. And he knew people, their strengths, their weaknesses, and what he can do to bring them mm -hmm. closer to him. And I think that was what helped Laurel and Diamonds Botswana to, to grow in terms of the output and was able to, to be kept and the other two properties or the, the, the other two factories in South Africa and in Namibia to close. I think it was his, his leadership style, his engagement, and the way that he, he engaged and touched people's lives by talking to them and knowing their families, what they stand for and where they are going and what they're passionate about. Wow. Wow. There is one word you keep repeating that resonates with me, touching people's lives. And that's what we stand for, isn't it? Yes. I, I say people love their families they feel comfortable in their family. So if you can make the workplace a family, then you expect the best out of your team. But if people feel victimized and threatened and not cared for, then they will not you know, do the best that you will be expecting. So I think there are lessons for both the business leaders and the teams as well. For example, in terms of understanding our teams, I was saying earlier that we shouldn't blame each other at this juncture. So as a team leader, for example, I know that there are some people that are not good. You send WhatsApp, they don't respond. I send an email, they won't even look. I, I know it. It has been happening over the years. So what do I do? I have to find out a way that works to work with this particular one. Yes. I cannot say, I send an email to everyone. I want to know, so and so, why didn't you respond? No. You are looking for blame game. Now, when you blame, you're not solving anything because you need everybody in the team. If it means this particular one, I have to send an SMS. That is what works for them. Then I will send an SMS. If it means I would rather call them. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, how, how is your family? If they like family, you ask about family. If they like weather, you say, hmm, today we have some very good sunshine. <laughs> you start from there. You know, it's a relationship at the end of the day. And you want things to work. So you take it from there. And then you can say, oh, I dropped you an email. I'm not sure whether you saw it. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Let me check. Then they check. And you continue working together. You have to understand each other. Yes. Now, I don't know. I wanted, I wanted us and uh, the community to benefit uh, from some of the lessons that you can give to business leaders and to employees in terms of 
looking at your experience as a human capital partner and also sitting in the industrial court. You don't necessarily have to, you know, uh, tell us specifics to say the case between so and so. No, 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 we don't need that. All we want is what are some of the things that businesses that, that you see that keep on coming up, the cases that keep, keep on coming up where you, you think, you know what, as business leaders, let's be careful of this and this and this. And also as employees or maybe as, as human capital, you know, practitioners. I think the, the, most of the, the, the cases that come there, it's because we, we don't have the, the patience to engage each other. We, I think we, uh, lately, and I was talking to one of the colleagues or one of the uh, industrial relations managers, we are litigious more as people now. That's, that's one. The second part is that, is what I mentioned earlier, that, you know, we are very quick to let people go without following the process. And the majority of our employees, in my view, they don't take the time to accustom themselves with the contract they've signed. They don't know what they've signed or they're very eager to sign that contract and keep on working without going back to the drawing board and say, what governs me? What is it that I can do? What is it that I cannot do? Most of the time you find that those, those people are ignorant and they're not, um, they don't take the time to know what they're supposed to be doing and then the, the, they're supposed to be doing. Because you'll find that the majority of the cases that we sit on at the industrial court, it's where a company was quick to, 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 to release somebody without following process, but had they taken the time and followed the process, they should have been able to, 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 to do that without having lost um, and being forced to now pay, let's say on average, six months for failure to, to follow process in terms of substantive fairness and procedural fairness. You find that the, the majority of the, of the employees are not, they don't, they don't, they don't read, they don't uh, make a research to find out what they're doing. Is it allowed? Or they think that they are untouchable and they can do whatever it takes. And, and there is one which is coming, which is not um, a problem yet, but in my view, it's coming where people are, are now becoming unscrupulous and they're becoming dubious in, in, in the process where we have lately seen that there's a lot of forged um, uh, qualifications out there. There is a lot of impersonation when it comes to interviews. There's a lot of things that, you know, had, had the, the company done its, its, its background checks, they should have not hired that company, that, that employee, because he has robbed um, um, another company or um, the way that he, what he stands for is not what that company stands for. And they should have not been hired in the first place. Wow. Wow. You have said a lot of things in a very short time. Thank you so much for that. Um, so in terms of um, streamlining processes and procedures um, during a crisis like this one, is there something you would want to say to that? I think uh, we, 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 most of the people are perfectionists. We, we, we don't want to fail, but the reality is that for one to get to or to be successful, one must fail. So the reality is that all the processes that have been done or that were there before the crisis are obsolete. And as, as, as we are now in this, in this pandemic, we are coming up with you know, short term uh, processes that can just work for now so that we keep afloat. So for me, my ask to, to businesses is that, let's document them. Let's now make them the, 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 the new norm and keep on going because the, the biggest downfall for us is to say, okay, Let's now wait until we've nailed it. We know what to do and we are sure this will work and this process. So if, if, if now customers are now allowed to now log in remotely and we are still finding out how we can improve, improve on the one that we came up to, just to improvise, let's document that and let's share it with people so that people can know and have a reference. And as we now improve, we should now um, revise them and keep them as a working document to get to the next level. And the reality is that a lot of 
uh, companies are going to re-engineer, especially the ones that are not operating now. And a lot of jobs are going to be taken away. So my ask to people is that they should be sitting and like we're saying, there are a lot of free courses out there. A lot of institutions have opened to say now that online courses that are for free that people should now work on. We should be now looking to see how are we now going to go back if now the, the business are opening, the ones that have been closed and they're not allowed to operate. Awesome. Ah, you are working in spirit. <laughs> you know why? No. You have already started answering a question that was uh, sent earlier on via chat by Bami. Okay. He, he is asking, most nations are planning on how to recession-proof their economies to withstand mm -hmm. future pandemics. Okay. What would be the impact of these strategies on the employment market? Could we see some jobs become redundant? <laughs> a lot of jobs, as we speak, are redundant. A lot of companies have gone under, as we speak. Yes, yes. And uh, a lot of, um, even some would not open at all. Yes. Uh, I'm sure if you, if you listen to the news, the companies that have now closed, like your Virgin Air Airline, they, they, mm -hmm. they have now gone under and they're not going to come back. Mm -hmm. So there are companies that are now looking and saying, you know what, what we've been doing, we've had a headcount of about 20 people. And right. in this mm -hmm. pandemic, we are able to operate with less than half of that. So I think that's, that's the norm. Let's see, we don't need that. And then we're going to let go of the others. But my, my ask to, to the companies to say that, Let's not be hasty to let people go. Let's, let's try for the economic activities. Let's at least look at reducing the salaries and having people rotate so that at least, as opposed to not having a salary, they have at least some sort of lower salary than what they used to get. That's, 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 that's what I should think the company should be doing. Thank you so much for mentioning that. It's a very, very difficult moment. Um, it's not, you know, I feel pain each time I hear that one person has lost a job because on average, one person who is working is most likely feeding seven people or more. So yes. when you have just one person losing a job, you can imagine what that means. Now when we have several thousands or millions of people losing jobs, it's, it's heartbreaking. But at the yes. same time, like you are saying, um, being heartbroken by the situation does not make things better. We need to find a way to say, how can I gather new skills? How can I start doing things differently? If I've lost my job, what sort of small business can I start or things like that? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the other part of the question from Bami is, and has this pandemic backtracked the efforts of the fourth industrial revolution of human and machine collaboration? Mm -hmm. Do you think the pandemic has backtracked the efforts of the fourth industrial revolution of, of human and machine collaboration? I think my, my view is that it has fast tracked. And now what we used to think about to say it's in future, this is what will happen in future. The future is now, it's here. And what we can do for ourselves to, to save ourselves from, from now losing it, we should be um, embracing it and now making sure that we embrace it, accept it, and see what is it that we can do to get to the next stage. We've been talking about it as if it's something that will come maybe after our retirement, but it's here and now. And we should now be embracing it because the reality is that those things that we're talking about, about the skills that we're going to need in the future, about the fact that now an employee will be in, in Africa or in Botswana, is now going to, to be like in, in the US or in Europe where they will have three or four different work. Let's say you work in the morning for two hours for that company and then you, you are now going to be having a side business and working for two other companies at night and studying at the same time. So those things are the new reality and you should be prepared. And my, my, my recommendation is that, like I said earlier, for that to, to be continue to be here, I think the infrastructure in terms of the network is needed from the government point of view, in terms of now making sure that that is taken care of so that accessibility to the, to the network that is needed 
for, 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 for the business to thrive is here. Um, I also think that uh, the companies should also educate people uh, more about how do, how do we protect the customer information um, working from home or working remotely so that now, you know, people who are hacking and, you know, stealing personal information, it is protected. And, you know, my family, as I work here and I have documents that I, I should be um, that are classified and they don't see that and I'm able to protect those, those information that I keep commuting or accessing while I'm at, at, at home. Beautiful. I, I see you keep on talking about the threats of, uh, you know, the cyber security issues. And actually, I, I did an interview with one expert from South Africa. He's called Ross Saunders. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to say to the community, those who are watching our videos, if you can go on my YouTube channel, it's called Dr. Wilbert Motoko, Dr. Wilbert Aram Motoko. That's my YouTube channel. Please go there and check for a video which talks specifically um, a lot about um, uh, cyber security. Um, so, um, having talked about these things, I think you, you are really advising us very well. Now, I know some of the things that I'm asking you are not in the interview questions, and I hope you are not worried by that. Yeah, because the interview questions are just there to guide us. Mm -hmm. I hope, Bami, your questions have been answered. If you still feel they are not yet fully addressed, feel free to send another chat. Thank you so much. Do, which opportunities, Mr. Jongman, do you think are presenting themselves right now? in business? I think it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting question because I was talking to someone and I said to them, in every crisis, um, there are low, a lot of um, opportunities out there. Like uh, for, 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 for now, a lot of, of people who did not have businesses, they registered businesses, especially when it came to uh, supply of, um, you know, hospital, um, um, you know, overalls, uh, masks, uh, cleaning equipment, and sanitizers. And I see now with the recently changed rules that everybody now who's going out there should have uh, masks. A lot of people are now jumping on that bandwagon and, you know, dusting off their skills and, you know, using the, their skills to now come up with those masks. So I, I must say there are a lot of opportunities out there. You know, for me, those that have lost jobs, they should look in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the economy and find out what is it that they can do by looking at bringing solutions. Because for me, it's about providing quality solutions and adding value and then getting paid for that. Because um, it's, 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 not, it's not everybody who knows their value, but you must look, you must have that, uh, microscopic, microscopic eye of looking for opportunities or providing solutions. And that's where, for me, where opportunities lie, so that you are now able to see what is it that is there. Like uh, I always say to people that I've interacted with in the past, they ask me, Jonglen, why do you have a small business consulting company, HR Consult? I said, you know, I never know what will happen. For me, that's a, that's a backup company, and I'm looking at um, where I can help you know, even on pro bono basis, even when now those that I can afford to charge, I can charge because, you know, by, you know, starting off by advising for free, then the work that you've done will talk for you and you'll earn a business opportunity or a contract because of the work that you've done for somebody else. Awesome. I really love that. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned uh, the issue of internet. I know that in some countries, internet is free for everyone. Yes. That would be very ideal. But obviously, it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. um, some of the governments cannot manage to provide internet for everybody for free. But I think, like you are saying, they need to really aggressively make, take some steps to discuss with the service providers and everybody to make sure there is internet everywhere. Imagine, for example, in Botswana right now, if internet was free for everyone everywhere, it means the only thing people would be thinking about, especially schools and universities, it would just be the gadgets. Mm -hmm. Anywhere you are, you connect to, to the Wi-Fi and you are performing. Employees all over the country, it will be easier. 
But now you realize that the employers have to start thinking about where, how to provide the internet to everybody. And um, if, if it's the schools, you now think of providing gadgets and providing internet for all your students. In many cases, there are several thousands of students. And I mean, at a time like this is very difficult. So I think after COVID-19, uh, the government together with the service providers needs to think seriously about this because to me, it doesn't look like COVID-19 is the last uh, pandemic that is hitting us. There, are, there is likely to be worse things coming and we have learned and we need to learn quickly. Could there be other things that um, you would like to share with us before we come to the end of our interview? And in the meantime, I would like to appreciate uh, Vesna, Borut, Bami um, for being with us. Please feel free to ask if you have any questions that you want to be answered right now. Yeah, I think in terms of what I have um, is to, for, for me, it's, it's just a word of encouragement to say that, um, like I said, those that have the jobs, let's, let's appreciate that we are very fortunate and let's keep them. Um, to those that don't have or that lost, unfortunately lost their jobs, it's not the end of the world. It's not how many times one falls, but it's about how many times that you dust yourself up and, and try again. You know, there's a, in, my, in my experience, I think a lot of, uh, I don't know whether it's, 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 it's a human thing that we don't like failing, but we can only learn when we fail. So let's try, let's, let's, let's start something and it doesn't work, it's okay. Let's keep up with now like, taking the lessons and trying again. Uh, for, for the businesses, especially when we try and ask people to work from home, as we'll be now reopening and reviewing to say the coming to back to work plans. Let's be considerate of other circumstances, like, like you're saying in the African continent. There are only a few people who would have a separate spare room where they will be able to work from. So as we ask people to work from home, let's consider all those circumstances. Let's consider people who are not able to have uh, the liberty of having a separate room as we ask them to come back to work and say, okay, we will continue to work from home. Um, let's, let's be considerate of these circumstances. Let's be considerate of the chairs that they use or the tables and they might not have, because for economic purposes, they might not be the most comfortable chairs to be working from and they're not going to help them to be productive. Um, let's, let's, where we can, let's, as we save on the rentals and ask people to go, let's help them to also invest in the offices at home. So, and um, th those are the few asks that I think people should take into consideration as they ask people to work from home or to come back to work. Thank you so much. I saw Vesna typing there that uh, very insightful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so in a nutshell, we talked about some of the challenges that HR or human capital um, practitioners uh, go through, especially during a time like this. We talked about some of the lessons that we can learn from what happens at the industrial court. Uh, we talked about the dangers of micromanaging and why, you know, as managers or as leaders, we need to learn to, you know, allow people to, to, to work from home and with that trust still there. And you also touched on the issue of policies that you think at national level and at uh, organizational level uh, should be uh, looked at. And we also uh, looked at uh, how leaders need to understand their teams and the teams need to understand their leaders for you know, a good relationship. And we also looked at uh, some opportunities, some jobs have been lost, uh, some businesses have gone under, including large enterprises in the developed world. This is serious, guys. Um, so I think also to, to our community, when we are talking about these things, don't look at your country only and you start crying, you start blaming, you blame the prime minister or the president or whoever. It's not time for blame game. If you have solutions, come to the table. Because now we are online. Yes. We are online. If you have suggestions, you can suggest your, those, uh, your, your very wise suggestions. I've seen people lambasting some people in top positions online. Mm -hmm. You read like this what everybody is saying. And there's not one person who is suggesting something to be done. And I'm wondering, okay, fine, they have a right 
it's their opinion, right? They have a right to say, this is being done well, this is being done wrongly. But I'm expecting at least one out of those people to say, this is what I think should have been done. The same way you criticize a football coach. You cannot say this football coach is useless. Look at the team that he's fielding. Ah, we have messed up. No. Tell us, so whom did you want to be on position number one? Okay, give us your dream team. How should it look like? And justify why you are saying that. And then we can take you seriously. Um, so let's not blame others out there, but let's try to come up with solutions. If you know something that is working in another country, maybe your leader doesn't know it. Maybe your parliamentarian doesn't know it. Maybe your manager doesn't know it. You bring it up to them or share a video link with them to say, this is what I was learning and I think you might be interested in it. You never know. They will watch it and they can make those differences. Um, and then we also talked about Wi-Fi, that where possible the governments should work with, um, you know, service providers. And I liked also where you mentioned that uh, in some cases, even as a consultant or in whatever you are starting to do, whether now or after COVID-19, uh, as you engage as a small business, learn to start free. Maybe you bake some queen cakes and you give to your neighbors and your whoever for free. And everybody says, hey, where did you get this? You say, no, it's me who begged. What? How much? You are now starting to make money, but you started free of charge. Because until we taste your queen cakes, we don't see a reason to buy from you because we don't know you. We have where we have already been buying, right? And then we talked about the issue of going the extra mile. Um, for example, as consultants, Mr. Jongman, as consultants, a... People can now get that same service from across the globe. And because of COVID-19, people are learning how to access those from anywhere, which means the competition is very high. Everybody in whatever space you are in, you have to go all out, do everything to improve daily. Otherwise, you will be out of business because now you are competing with the rest of the world. And by the way, Mr. Jongman, just for your appreciation, you had me talking of Borut and Vesna. They are watching us live from Tenerife, Spain. Oh, okay. This just tells you <laughs> what the Wi-Fi can do. <laughs> so imagine they are watching you and they are like, wow, this Jongman is a star. This guy is sharp. After this, they will be asking for your contact and you do business with them. The other day I was interviewing a guy in Turkey. And we were talking about business leadership and opportunities and things like that. So you never know what happens. The other day I was interviewing a guy from Nigeria, a friend of mine from Nigeria. And after that, he suggested we do certain things in West Africa. So, I mean, we, we just have to go all out. We need to go all out in everything we do because you never know who is watching you. You never know who is listening to you. So we want to advise our community, whatever it is you are doing, go the extra mile. Mr. Jongman, thank you so much for your time. Your thank time you is highly for, appreciated. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity. And uh, I hope we'll do some more and uh, also look forward to also learning from other business leaders out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bami. Thank you, Borut, and thank you, Vesna. The Lord bless you. you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.